So a lot has changed in our world, especially in the church. It's estimated that one out of five churches will close their doors permanently after the COVID pandemic. Uh, this raises a lot of questions. Questions like, has the church failed? Is the church even gonna exist in the next thousand or even hundred years? With all these questions looming, we've seen a major shift in what church looks like. And so this is why it's so important to go into God's word and why we're studying verse by verse through the book of 1 Thessalonians. This book was written in letter form to some churches in Thessalonica, and Paul is going to encourage us today. In fact, by the end of this message, my hope is, is that we would see in the text a metric system of success that God uses to determine what the church is supposed to look like. Hey, I want to welcome you here as we continue in 1 Thessalonians. My name's Jared. If you're watching in a home church, we're so glad that you're joining us today. If you're not, we still want to invite you to follow along. It's really going to be important throughout this series that you use the teaching notes that are available online. If you go to the Hub site, our church hub, my1116.info, uh, you'll actually can scroll over to gatherings, look for Sunday Online. This is what this is. And you'll see an entire guide for the service. And in that guide, you'll see a link there that has my teaching notes that are available each week. I want you to follow along, especially if you're leading in a home church. There's going to be some great moments throughout this series to be able to pause, to discuss, to dig a little deeper. I wish, I was telling Jeremy just a minute ago, I wish I had about an hour to go deeper, but we know because this is video, it makes it a little bit tougher. And two, it gives you an opportunity to break some things down. So before we get in 1 Thessalonians, let's kind of remind ourselves of some of the major themes and ideas of why we're studying this book in the first place. So let's go to Colossians chapter 3 again. Colossians chapter 3, and I'm just going to read verses 1 through 4. Paul says this. He says, if you then be raised with Christ, in other words, if you're a Christian, if you're a believer, he says, seek those things that are above, in the clouds, right? That's what this series is called, is keeping our head in the clouds. He says, this is where Christ is. He says, seated at the right hand of God. And then verse 2 says, set your mind on things above and not on things of this world. In other words, our focus as Christians while we wait on God's return is to still keep our attention towards God, right? Towards the heavenlies, towards where he's at, focusing on who he is and what he's done. And so we're going to be talking a little bit about eschatology, especially we'll talk a lot more about it towards the end. And eschatology is just the doctrine of end things. There's a lot of confusion about end times. And so we're going to go through some of those issues. Paul's actually going to address some concerns that the church in Thessalonica had. Uh, but before we get there, there's some things that we need to understand and learn first, because God does not just desire for us to aimlessly live our lives with no purpose, with no idea or concepts of hope, but he desires us to live our lives and understand what the end is going to look like, understand eternity, understand what it means to be in a relationship with him forever. And so these are some of these concepts we'll be looking at. Last week, if you weren't here, we kind of answered some basic questions. We do this anytime we open up a book of the Bible. We're asking questions like, who wrote it? You know, uh, who's the author writing to? Uh, when was it written? Why was it written? And what does it have to do with me? And so if you haven't watched uh, week one, I encourage you to do that. But we're actually going to dive right back in and go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. We're going to begin reading in verse 2. All right, here we go. Verse 2 says this. He says, we give thanks to God for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith, your labor of love, and your steadfast of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. So the first thing that Paul mentions there in verse 2 is something really interesting. He says this, he says, we give thanks to God always for you. All right, so he says, we're thanking God for you. Who is you? Remember, this is the church in Thessalonica. Really, this is all those that are in Christ. So I would say like the capital C church, the body of Christ, every believer, every Christian, Paul is saying, I'm thanking God for the church, right? And that's really important. Before we move on to anything else, and again, I know everybody's interested, like we want to talk about end time, we want to talk about pre-trib and post-trib, and but while we wait on his return, it's important that we understand the blessing, the gift 
that is the church because that's exactly what the church is meant to be while we wait on the Lord. It's supposed to be a gift. In James chapter 1, verse 17, James tells us that every good and every perfect gift is from above. And where is our head at, right? If our head is set in the clouds, if our head is on things above and not on things of this earth, we're remembering that when we look around us, God has given us gifts in order that we can live and get through this life. And one of the greatest blessings and gifts that he's given us that Paul says that he's giving thanks for is the church, right? So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11 he says, this is what the church is supposed to do. I know we're kind of skipping ahead, but, but it matters because I want you to see what a gift the church is. He says, therefore, he says, I want you to encourage one another. This is talking to us, the church, right? He says, I want you to encourage one another and build one another up. That's literally to edify. And that's really what we're filtering everything through when we gather together. We're asking a couple of questions. The first question is this, are we bringing God glory? That's our first desire, is we wanna bring God glory. But our second desire is we want to edify one another. And that's what this verse means, is that we're encouraging, that we're lifting up one another. And Paul says, just as you're doing. In other words, they're already constantly doing it. Now, I've got some other cross-references, some other scriptures there, especially like Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. Uh, I would encourage you maybe to pause in this moment to read through some of those texts. Uh, because again, is great of a gift of the church that it is to us. Uh, Colossians 3.13 also says to bear one another, right? So sometimes we have to put up with one another. It doesn't mean that things are always perfect, but there's value in the church. And I know it may look so much different than what you're used to. It may continue to look different over the next 10, 20 years, but don't forget that what God is giving us is a gift. He's given us each other. And so, in fact, while you're pausing, why don't you take some time, not only to maybe to read some of those scriptures, but I have some questions for you that may be some like really great discussion questions for you to, to, to just hear from one another. Um, so questions like this, what about the church makes you thankful? Because Paul says, man, I give thanks to God for you. Paul had a reason to be thankful for the church. What is your reason to be thankful for the church? It could be 1116, it could be the church as a whole. Uh, the other question, and this may kind of show the heart of where your thankfulness is coming from, but what do you want out of the church? Like, what is your desires when you attend or you, you are a part of a church community? Um, and then lastly, and this is kind of where we're going to stay in the rest of this message, is uh, when it comes to attending a church, uh, what is the measurement of success or failure? You know, do you think that just because a lot of people show up that that's a successful church? Is it because maybe the music is really good? You're like, man, that's a great church. That church has the it factor, right? What are the elements of what makes up a successful or a failing church? And so maybe just spend a moment or two with each other. You can pause it if you want to, discussing some of those things. But I'm just going to keep on moving right along because, again, so many people look at the surface level things when it comes to what they determine a good church is, what they determine a successful church. And if there's one thing that I could teach you as your pastor is, because again, I know we live in a military community, so there's a lot of people that have to transition in and out of the CSRA. Uh, there are some of you that just move away because of jobs, because of family. Um, and there are some of you that may only be at 1116 for a season, and that's okay. But what I desire for you is to understand what a successful church looks like. In fact, God desires us to learn this because if you're going out looking for a church based on superficial, like surface level things, there, there's not gonna be any deep value that you're gonna stick around later for. We wanna find things that, that keep us in it while we wait on the Lord, even in difficult times, even in persecution, even when we frustrate one another. It's gonna help us to maintain and to endure and to give thanks to God no matter what circumstances we're in because we see the church as a gift. And so let's talk about the church success metric system that the Bible uses, not what we use, but what the Bible uses. And maybe we'll see what we value versus what God values, because it may be different, all right? In the text, we're gonna see some deeper values that matter to God, again. And we're trying to keep our head in the clouds, right? We're trying to keep our focus on things above and not on things of this earth. So these characteristics should matter most to us because they matter most to God. So let's look back at the text in 1 Thessalonians, 
in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, back in verse 3, he says that what matters is this. He says there is a work of faith, a labor of love, and then lastly, a steadfastness in hope, which is in Christ Jesus, right? So, so don't miss this. There's three things to God that really matters. A work of faith, a labor of love, a steadfast of hope. For the next few weeks, until we get to the last two chapters, which deal specifically with eschatology, with end times, Paul is prepping us here. He, he's showing us what we do while we wait on the Lord. And so each week, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into these characteristics. So make sure you stick around. Today, I'm just going to kind of give you a baseline understanding, but I encourage you to be back each week so we can dig deeper in what each of these mean and what each of these are supposed to look like in our church community, right? Because again, these are the determining factors that Paul and that God desires us to understand what really matter to God. So the first one is this. He says, I want you to have a work of faith. Now, it does not say, I want you to work for your faith. Again, faith is a free gift from God given to us that we receive in grace, and it's not of works that you're saved. But that's not what he's referring to. He's not referring to salvation and the fact of you need to work for your salvation. What he's talking about is that when you receive the free gift of salvation and God gives you faith to believe in what he has done, it activates something. In fact, a work of faith is this. Faith is actually putting it into practice. And that's what God desires, right? For us to put our faith into action. So let's go to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says this. He says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So he says we have an assurance, we have a conviction, we, we, we know that we know uh, who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. And because of this, because this is what a work of faith will do, what we believe will dictate what we do. That's so important. What we believe will dictate what we do. So if we have faith that Jesus is who he said he was, that Jesus did what he said he did, and that Jesus will come back one day, it will impact the actions that we live out today as Christians. That's what faith is. Faith is supposed to be an action. The second thing that he mentions is this. He says, I want you to have a labor of love. Now again, love is active. Love is following through on our faith. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, uh, Paul tells us, he says, For in Christ there is neither circumcision nor uncircumcision. In other words, uh, Jew versus Gentile. Uh, there was a big ethnic division in Paul's day, just kind of like how there is today. It was just between Jews and Gentiles. And what he's trying to teach them is it doesn't matter whether you're Jewish or Greek. It says it doesn't count for anything. He says, but here's what matters. But only faith, so there's our first part, right? we got to have a working faith, but then faith working through love. So how is it exemplified when our faith is lived out? It's exemplified through love. And then if you drop down to verse 14 in Galatians chapter 5, Paul says this. He says, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. Some of you are like, yeah, I want to keep the Ten Commandments. You can't. You'll, you'll screw it up. You'll mess it up because you're human, right? But the reality is, is that there's over 600 plus different laws and regulations that God gave to the nation of Israel. Um, some of these were moral laws. Some of these were ceremonial laws. But these laws that he gave were not so much meant for us to try and remember and to keep up with all of them, but understanding that we need Jesus in our life. We need faith in our life. But once faith is ignited, uh, Paul simplifies what our lives should be doing actively in one word, he says, and it's through loving. He says you can fulfill the, the law in one word, and then he says you shall love, that's the word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So not only what we believe we do, but why we do it matters. And that's what the labor of love is, right? So in other words, we can be out working for our own gain, for our own kingdom, for our own devices, and that's not good faith, right? A good working faith is coming from a place of love. The motivation is love. Because I love God, I wanna love my neighbor as myself. Because I love God, really because he first loved me, I wanna love even my enemy. So, so why we do it matters as well. 
The last part is this. He says, I want you to have, and he, and he says it uh, in verse uh, 3, back in 1 Thessalonians. He says, I want you to have a steadfast of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. A steadfast of hope. So what is hope? Hope is something that enables us to press on and to endure. Again, while we're waiting on the return of the Lord, while we're waiting on his coming, things are hard. Church is hard, right? Community is hard. Our jobs are hard. Raising children is hard. Getting married is hard. Being single is hard. Life is hard, but hope stands in the way to give us perseverance, to help us to endure when we feel like we can't anymore. And this is why Paul says it's a steadfast hope. It's not just a hope in the good time, but it's a hope even in the difficult times. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, he says, For to this end we toll and we strive. In other words, again, it's hard work. It is work, right? He says, but it's because we have hope set on the living God. Now, what is that hope? He actually describes it in 1 Timothy chapter 4. He says, the hope is this, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. So our hope leads us to eternity, leads us to the where, right? So our work of faith is what we do because of what we believe, right? Our labor of love is why we do it, because that matters. And then our steadfast of hope is where we're going. It's leading us to eternity with Jesus. So this is what a faithful, healthy, successful church looks like. It's a church that has faith. It's a church that's loving one another and loving their neighbor and loving the world. It's a church that has a hope and a foundation that's grounded in who Jesus is and what Jesus has done and Jesus's return. Like this is what God cares about. He doesn't care about all the other superficial stuff that sometimes we value. This is what he values. So when you're looking for a church, maybe you have to leave here. Maybe you move away. This is what you should be looking for. Where's their faith in? Like, what is their faith in? How do they love one another? And then where is their hope grounded in? Like, what is sustaining them? Because if it's in the world, if it's in things of the world, they're going to crack and crumble and close the doors and fall. But if it's on things above, if our head is in the cloud, we will have the endurance in order to get through anything. These concepts are so important that Paul brings them up in 1 Corinthians 13, 13. He's talking about spiritual gifts, but at the end of it, he closes with this because he doesn't want the church to get distracted with spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts can be an important aspect of our life, but they're not the main thing. They're secondary things. And so he closes out even with this in 1 Corinthians 13, 13 with what the main thing is in the church. He says this. He says, so now faith and hope and love abide. The same three things we've been talking about, right? Paul, again, reiterates this to the church in Corinth. He says, this is what God values, faith, hope, and love. But then he adds this element. He says, these three, but the greatest of these is love. The greatest of these is love. No wonder why Paul says you can fulfill the word in one law is to love, right? So I want to invite you back each week as we Dig a little bit deeper into each of these characteristics because, again, things are going to get hard. Things are going to change. Uh, people have left. Um, some could even look at our church and say, we are a failure. But I believe that God cares about something more than the surface level. I think he's actually looking at our churches and saying, what does our faith look like? What does our love look like? And where is our hope at? I encourage you to be back with us next week as we dig and look into a work of faith. We, we dive a little bit deeper into that. I'm really excited. But we're going to go ahead and transition now into a time of communion. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 17 through 34, um, is the reminder of what brings us into the family of God in the first place. Remember, Paul says, he says, I want to give thanks to God for you. And, and I do the same thing. I am so thankful for every single one of you that are just faithfully exploring and experimenting with us and just trying to bring glory to God and edify people. Thank you for sticking it out. Thank you for giving and supporting and praying and, and engaging and, and practicing your faith. Like these things are so important. And so what brings us into that church community, into that family is Jesus. 
And so every week we take communion together to remember the bread and the new covenant in the cup, the blood, and to remind us, and through those two little elements of bread and juice, it's a, it's a reminder of what Jesus has done to bring us into the family of God. And so if you wanna re maybe read through that text this morning, if you wanna spend some time maybe repenting, um, getting our hearts prepared and right before we take communion. Um, if you're a non-believer, we ask that you don't take communion. This is a great time for parents as well, maybe to share the gospel with your children through these two elements. It's like a STEM project. You can pull them out and share what the bread symbolizes, what the juice symbolizes, and share the gospel with them. But why don't you take just a few moments in this next call to action and take communion together as a church family. I wanna thank you so much for joining us today. And if you have any needs, prayer requests, really questions, you need counseling, whatever it is, we want you to know that our pastors are here to help and serve you. And so one of the things that we've done to try and make it as easy as possible is we have what we call our pastoral care resources. You can find it on the hub at my1116.info. There's some forms to fill out if you wanna have some counseling done. Uh, there's some stuff you can fill out for questions or needs. Uh, again, our leaders are here to serve you. We wanna be active in your life, not just uh, people behind a screen teaching, but if there are needs, if there's questions, wh whatever we can do, we wanna walk with you in your faith and, and really help you grow. Uh, help you grow closer to Jesus, help you grow in the church, and help you make an impact in our world. And so use those pastoral care resources. Again, uh, but thank you for joining us today. We love you guys. We're really excited about this series. Can't wait to see you next week as we continue in our Head in the Cloud series in First Thessalonians.